And welcome everyone to the second offering in CSSW's Writing Live series, in which our accomplished faculty, alums, and colleagues take part in roundtable discussions about their lives as writers, describing their approaches, challenges, and strategies for success. I want to thank Adam Pellegrini and Chin Gao for organizing this series. Today, we're excited to be joined by a truly esteemed set of practitioners and scholars of clinical social work who will share their experiences writing in and about their fields of practice. Writing, as you know, is critical across all areas of social work. And we're hoping that today's panel will offer you insights and inspiration for your own writing lives, whether you are beginning your journey in social work or you're already firmly established in your career. We're also hoping that this forum gives you an opportunity to connect, collaborate, and advocate as writers in the coming weeks and months ahead as we move through this especially difficult time in our history. We look forward to future events, especially as ones with specific focus on writing as a tool for anti-racist work and social justice work, as well as healing. It's now my great pleasure to give a brief introduction uh, of our panelists today. Anne Barack Weiss taught for 30 years at Columbia School of Social Work and is now faculty in the program in narrative medicine. Dr. Barack Weiss has edited a wonderful book, Narrative in Social Work Practice, featuring first person accounts by social workers who have integrated narr narrative approaches into their practice. And I can personally attest to her dedication as uh, a beloved CSSW alum. Jelana Harris joined the Columbia faculty in 2018. Dr. Harris has dedicated her career to the social, emotional, and psychological development of traditionally oppressed populations. She also has extensive experience in social development and community organizing, including her work as Director of Youth and Family Programs for the New York City Parks Department. Jin Yu Liu is Associate Professor of Social Work here at Columbia. Dr. Liu's research focuses on aging and health, with a focus on improving the quality of life among older adults and their family caregivers. She studies determinants of mental health and well-being in later life, particularly among Asian communities. Mary Sormonti is Professor of Professional Practice here at Columbia. Dr. Sormonti has extensive experience in hospital-based social work. She has developed a body of clinical and community-based work focusing on therapeutic responses to the traumas associated with terminal illness, bereavement, intimate partner violence, and disaster. So again, thanks to all of our panelists for joining us today. The way we're gonna go is this. After, I'm gonna give an opportunity in a moment for each of our panelists to give a, a few minutes talking about their writing lives. Then we're going into a, a, a sort of a round table discussion uh, to talk further about their lives, their choices and their experiences as writers. And we're going to leave the last 10 or 15 minutes of this session to open questions, Q&A with our audience. So as Adam said, please take good advantage of that Q&A box uh, that you see on the screens. So now I'm going to turn to our panelists and we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So I'll start with you, Anne. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about your writing life? Thank you, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for this invitation and the opportunity to think about the way social work and writing come together in my life. I've been a social worker for 50 years and a writer since I learned that one could write down what was in your head and people would read it. So I've been a writer for 75 years. Social work and writing sprang from the same source, an interest in people and stories of how they coped with the many bad, sad things that happen in the course of any life. When I entered CUSW in 1969 and was placed in an agency serving the aged, I knew I had found my people. Survivors of concentration camps in Europe, poverty and segregation in foreign lands, the deep south in New York, illness and disability, and the stigma attached to old age itself, <clears throat> along with the family professional and paraprofessional caregivers, all had stories that illustrated their strengths as well as their troubles, stories that I hoped would change minds about who old people were, what they were capable of, and what they needed to keep on keeping on. So I began writing short pieces to give at conferences, essays for journals and books, co-authoring books on supervision, on practice with the aging. Um, the challenge that pushed me into this was social work's privileging of data over story, and this trend has deepened over the years I've been in the field. Stories are often devalued as anecdotes 
and used to liven up a research paper of graphs and numbers. Many social workers are now required to become reverse alchemists, turning the gold of story into the drag of data. Pull up a file in your agency and tell me if all the checked boxes give you any idea of the person this file is about. And to be timely, I might insert here that there were realms of data collected by worthy advocacy agencies <clears throat> about police brutality, but it was not until names and faces and stories reached the public that there was a movement for change. So countless letters to the editor, few were ever published, essays in community, newspapers, and the New York Times, and now on an aging blog, arouse from my desire to redress this balance. And as I was challenged to stand up for story, I was also challenged to see myself as part of the story, to acknowledge that any story I observed or reported on had me in it, with all the conscious and unconscious baggage that not only shaped what I took in, but what I gave out. Uh, I am deeply grateful to Columbia University Press, strong supporters of books from our social work faculty that allowed me to write two trade books uh, that hopefully would appeal to both the professional and lay audience. And what I am most proud of, Melissa also mentioned, but doesn't hurt to say it twice, narrative and social work practice, the power and possibility of story. I was co-editor with Lynn Lawrence, an alumni of our school, um, and Mary Somanti, who was on this panel, wrote a wonderful chapter on how she integrates narrative into her classroom work. And the especially interesting thing about this book, I think, is each chapter was written by a social worker who introduced it by saying who she was and what brought her to what, to what she was doing. So that's all I have to say for now. And I'm interested in meeting the panel members and to looking at you instead of my paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Jelana, please. Thanks, Melissa. I'm so glad to be here and, and share with all of you. So uh, my writing, uh, for the most part, really, you know, in working in practice has revolved a around a lot of my clinical practice and, and doing things like progress notes and psychotherapy notes, um, court documents, sentencing reports, things of that nature. And the most, most recently in the last few years, my work has focused a lot on um, my research, um, which is around Black women and really writing for Black women from the perspective of a Black woman. I think this is really important considering historically our stories have been told by people who don't look like us and don't understand our lived experiences, right, or see them through the lens of white supremacy, um, which is also, you know, problematic. Um, and it's also usually not done in a participatory way that engages Black women in, in telling their stories. Uh, and so a lot of my work recently has focused on doing this through um, um, writing uh, peer-reviewed articles, uh, proposals for grants and proposals for different conference presentations. Um, and finally, I'm really working hard now on establishing a blog um, for my practice that really speaks to some of the themes and issues that, are, that I see coming up uh, very frequently um, to allow women a space to share their stories and also hear from other women um, who have similar experiences uh, and being able to sort of link that to some of the clinical um, the clinical research that we have now um, and to be able to sort of make a connection between these experiences and what they look like from a clinical perspective as well as grounding them in uh, understanding anti-black racism and, and how that impacts um, women differently and specifically intersectionality, right? So how that impacts women and black women specifically uh, differently than it does uh, other folks. Thanks. Thank you, Jelana. Jin Yu. Hi everyone, my name is Jin Yu. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work. Um, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Melissa and Adam. Thank you for in inviting me to be on this panel. Um, how to view my writing? Um, actually, I'm a social work researcher. Most of my research products are delivered by writing papers, grant proposals, reports, and the intervention guideline. So when I was about to start my career, uh, a senior college told me that, you know, as a scholar, not writing means not working. <laughs> he tried to told me, tell me that no matter how much literature I've read, 
no matter how much data I've collected or how much analysis I've done. If I'm not writing them down, I don't produce any knowledge. So writing is a very essential part of my job. At work, my purpose of writing is to deliver um, my knowledge, opinions, and sometimes suggestions. Uh, and at the same time, writing could also help me think and check my own rationale and logic. In terms of writing style, uh, I try my best to write sentences and paragraphs concisely and clearly. Um, most of the time now, I'm writing in English, which is not my native language that I learned from my childhood. Uh, I don't know how many of you are writing in your second or third languages. Language is always connected to logic and value. Different languages maybe are connected to different types of communication styles. So for me, uh, so I spend a little bit of time to learn uh, how people always, you know, communicate, what kind of styles they follow, what kind of logic ways they follow uh, when they try to tell uh, their own uh, opinions or stories. So, well, for this step, I think reading other people's <laughs> writing is very helpful for a second language writer. Uh, another point I want to share at the very beginning is um, um, my goal uh, of writing is try to make it clear, as I mentioned. So um, one of the challenges I always have, or even until today, I almost struggle every day is try to organize an integrated narrative to make my writing logically consistency and uh, consistent and smoothly. So uh, one strategy I always use is to offline my major points before writing the first sentence. Um, it is very helpful, you know, when I, especially when I write a kind of a long, uh, maybe paper or long narrative, I think have a outline, uh, outlining guidelines very helpful. Uh, then another uh, strategy or, 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 or tips I always use uh, is to review and revisit my writings after a few days or a few months or even a few weeks. Um, then I will have a standpoint of a reader to understand my thoughts and the rationale because just as uh, mentioned by, um, uh, by other uh, presenters, because writing, when we write, we try to uh, let others to read our mind. Then, so if we have a perspective of the reader to read our writings, it's really helpful to make our writing understandable and readable. Thank you. Thank you, Jin Yu. Mary, what do you want to share with us at the start? I just wanted to unmute myself. Uh, apologies for losing my visuals there for a moment. I thought what I would, because I'm coming last, I thought what I would share with you is why I think writing is so important. And I'll, I'll connect it a little bit with, with the writing I've done as well. Um, to begin, I would say that writing is the most difficult thing that I do or among the most difficult things that I do. And at the same time, or on the other hand, it's also one of the most rewarding things that I do when I can complete it successfully. So it's really a dialectic. I, I struggle with it. I love it. I love other people's writing. And so that pushes me on to keep writing. And yet, it really is a struggle. I like to see I like to see my writing come to completion, and I think that probably comes from being an academic. As Jinyu was saying, a lot of my writing is academic style writing for journals, for um, grant proposals, and the like. When I started, so that doesn't give me a lot of creativity, right? There's a, there's a certain format to be followed. And in certain ways for me, that's comforting because somebody's telling me what to do. And I think I'm pretty good at being able to do it. On the other hand, um, most of the writing that I did, both as a, as a young kid 
And then as a clinician, it's a little bit more creative. Um, like Jelana, a, a big chunk of my writing for years was as a clinician. So I was writing, I was writing about, from my perspective, what the people I was working with were, were going through and what I thought would be helpful for other professionals that I was working with in the hospital, for example, mm -hmm. to know about the people I was working with. And there are, of course, lots of things I needed to be very cautious about when I was writing for that reason, uh, but I'm sure, or I'm guessing we probably have time to get into that a little bit later. There are lots of reasons why I think we should write. Thanks so much to all of our panelists. Um, I'd like to start with a question I'll throw out and you can jump in and, and uh, whoever wants to, to answer. Some of you have already referred to your challenges and I noticed uh, as people signed up, they talked a lot about challenges you can face as a writer. And I think what we want to focus on now is a little bit more of those challenges and your strategies for getting around them, whether it's writer's block, productivity issues, but uh, I just want to open that up and, and have folks jump in. Hmm. I'm looking at Anne because I <laughs> consider her to be a, a very accomplished writer. Um, I would say first off, and then I'm gonna be quiet and hear what others have to say, that I, I know what the tips are that other writers who I admire tell me, and I try to use those. For example, write every day, ask other people to take a look at what you've written, I don't always do that, but I'm trying more and more to do those two things in particular, to just sit down, even if I don't think i am got it clear in my head yet to do, I'll sit down anyway and just start writing down bits of even disjointed information, just get it on paper, and then I can come back and look at it, hopefully, and put a little bit more coherence to it. I guess mm -hmm. the challenge for me, as I mentioned, is seeing yourself as part of your writing. Mm -hmm. Even if you're doing a research study, why did you pick this subject? Why did you look at these particular parts of the subject? You're always a part of it, and I struggle with this all the time, with, with what, is, what am I writing about? And um, yeah, what, what are the biases? What are the points of view that I don't realize are getting into my writing uh, that I need someone else to point out to me? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, having the, the passion to express our thoughts or deliver our knowledge, I think is very essential. Uh, and to me, uh, as I mentioned, the writing is very essential in my job. Otherwise, I will not keep my job if I'm not writing. However, um, honestly, when I write, not every, not every day I, I really enjoy writing, <laughs> but I have to write. So mm -hmm. one of my strategies is to prioritize the best time and also the best cognitive st status I have for writing. So I usually don't write when I'm tired. I don't usually mm -hmm. I don't write when I feel not comfortable. So, so I always prioritize the best time for writing. That's my tips to complete my writing task. Yeah, and I'll just um, sort of jump in on what other folks have already said in terms of really making the writing personal in a lot of ways and prioritizing specific times. Um, I think some of the things that I've learned is that a writing session doesn't have to be five hours long and, and this idea of going in and saying I'm going to write for 20 or 30 minutes, even doing very specific time sessions has been really helpful for me. I think when you, when you come out of school um, and, and you jump into trying to write, you keep some of that same energy where you're like, um, you're like stuffing a lot of stuff into to, you know one short time frame because you've got a paper due or something like that. Um, and I think that that creates a lot of negative energy around writing and it, it, it kind of like binds you up a little bit. Um, other things that have really been helpful to me have been writing with other people. And so um, around the time I was doing my dissertation, I would join these writing groups where folks would just come in, sit in the room and everyone's just writing. Um, not a lot of like conversation or chit chat. We're not writing about the same things or writing together per se but just the energy and the space of knowing that other people are kind of doing this with you. And I think also just a change of scenery. It's kind of hard sometimes mm -hmm. to like write in your home in the same place that you have all these distractions going on. Um, 
another tip I would say is something that, that an, an instructor told me years ago, which was called button chair technique, she called it. And it's just like sit in your chair and stop, you just sit there. Um, and it's likely you're going to turn on your screen and it's likely you're going to do something, but the anxiety of getting to that space will kind of just keep you again, like bound. Um, there's something about once you're in the space that the writing tends to come out once you open that screen. Um, and the last thing I'll share for me specifically, writing has historically been something that I've had to do in another person's language, really. Like it, it hasn't really reflected the way that I speak and the way that I understand things. And uh, growing up in school, writing that you books that we read, articles that we read a lot of times, again, didn't reflect the way that I talk or topics that were meaningful to me. So it was really important for me to engage with Black writers um, and begin to hear things in, in a voice that sounded, that it connected with me uh, and personalized the writing for me. Uh, and also making a shift from academic writing to creative writing, which also sort of um, releases the tension that I was, I, I have a lot of writing anxiety, so release some of the tension that I experienced and knowing that those two things did not have to be disconnected in the way that I had experienced them for most of my life. Uh, and so that has really supported me in freeing myself up to to write in a way that uh, speaks really from, from my, my heart. Um, but also, you know, tr working later to make that fit any kind of like academic, you know, needs that it has to, but not trying to do that from the start. I think that was a real problem for me is trying to make force it to fit this, um, this academic style without getting my thoughts out first. Mm. I would like to piggyback on Jelana and simply say that to write, you should read, read a lot and read the kinds of things that you are writing and that you want to write. And when I suddenly realized one day that I'm an essayist, that's my genre, I think in terms of essay, I thought of all the essayists that I really admire and I just read them and I still continue to read them and I read books on writing essays. <laughs> and, and so what, whatever is your interest, there are really wonderful models out there. And the other thing I want to say is that you're not only writing when you're sitting at the computer, or at the desk, you're writing all the time in your head. Mm -hmm. I am writing always whenever I'm working on something, ideas are coming to me and all I can say is, I have no special advice except carry a notebook or a piece of paper with you all the time mm -hmm. because something will come to you, you'll be reading, you'll be walking, you'll be talking, you'll be doing something and you will get an idea and you just write that right down there. And that those two things, reading and, and making notes of, of my thoughts as they go by, have been very helpful. I, uh, can I add one, two more small yes. tips, building off what others have said as well. Um, working when I can, part of when I sort of really can work through some anxiety, I agree that working with a group is super helpful um, because people are, not only do they provide useful critiques, but they also provide, at least in my experience, a lot of encouragement, no matter where you are in the writing process. So that's been very helpful for me. So I would suggest seeking out support. Um, and the reading as well, as Anne said. And then finally, particularly with clinical writing, what's helpful for, part of what has been helpful for me is really to remember why I'm writing. I'm writing, it's not the only writing that can be done and it's got some limitations as well, but I'm writing to support someone else. I'm writing because I want to um, explain to other people what's going on in this person's life so that they will be more empathetic, more sensitive, if you will. So it's been really helpful to keep reminding myself when I've done that, this is for a really good reason. You might be one of the few people other than the person that I'm writing about themselves, which is obviously huge, to convey important information about their situation. It's very interesting because I think when we <clears throat> the, you know, maybe the traditional way to think about writing is as a very solitary activity. And several of you have now referred to writing as a social activity um, in the sense that <clears throat> you like to write with others in the room. Maybe it's just accountability, keeping you on task. But just wondering too, to what extent 
Do you uh, rely on others uh, to give feedback? Are there people around the country? Is it just one or two people? How do, how does, how do you utilize that as a second pair of eyes or, or, or do you? I can say that for me, um, if I'm writing something academic, I, I don't usually do that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why that is, but the only feedback I tend to get or that I tend to seek is from the editor or the readers of manuscripts that I've sent in. Where I do, where I have sought um, while I'm writing uh, feedback from have been editors of books. So when I've been asked to contribute a chapter to a book, the editors of that book, at least in my experience writing chapters, are extreme, when you have a good editor, all along that person is providing encouragement, but also giving really useful critiques. If this part's unclear, why don't you say it a different way? Can you bring yourself more into the discussion? So really when I'm doing book chapters has been when I've, when I've um, consulted with other people and sought their direct advice. I've belonged to a book group um, for many years. I, I find though that I want to be pretty sure what I'm writing before I go into the group. I mean, because I, it can sometimes sway your direction. So it, it, it's, it's really good to kind of follow my own star, so to speak, and then bring something when it's pretty near completion um, and, and then get that. And we all read each other and we learn from each other's work, of course. And I didn't realize till I edited the co-edited the book that Mary is in how wonderful editing is teaches you about writing. It really does. It, it, it's it was a great privilege and great fun to edit a book, as well as a lot of a lot of work, <laughs> but great fun. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um. um in terms of getting feedback from other people. Uh, I agree with Mary, and most of the times when we do academic uh, uh, write academic papers or proposals, most of the time we got feedback from reviewers. But occasionally, if I have something that I thought is complicated, uh, or I'm not sure whether it's understandable or whether the logic, the rationale uh, really makes sense, I sometimes send to uh, colleagues or friends, uh, you know, before sending, sending it out. Especially, uh, I tend to send, sometimes I tend to send the, the papers, the proposals, the proposal to the ones who are not in my field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I can really get a sense whether it's understandable, whether my thought is reasonable. So um, it depends. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to second that too. I think it's really important to kind of have someone review your work who doesn't know much about it because that really, I think when you're so steeped in what you're writing about, you kind of tend to assume that folks are going to get it or folks understand this, these concepts and terminology and that's not always the case. Um, and then the other thing I'll add is that for me, it's really important that I connect with the audience, right? So like, one of the most important people to read my work is my mother. I write a lot about Black women and so I need to know that that resonates, right? I need to know that I'm not saying anything that could be, uh, that feels harmful, particularly because she's from a different generation than I am. And so um, it's really important for me to get the feedback from the folks that I, I hope my work reaches um, and, and that it's written in a way that's, that's also, um, that folks can connect with it, right? That it, doesn't, that it doesn't feel so overly academic, that it's not gonna have meaning for the audience that I mean it for, right? And, that, and who I want to support. Um, and also it helps that my mom was an elementary school teacher for years, so she tends to remember those grammar rules <laughs> that I always that's forget. Great. So she can like rip through that thing um, in a way that like is really kind of helpful for me. I think I'd like to meet your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Can I add one more um, place that I do seek feedback? Please Is do. if I'm writing, it's not so much that I seek feedback for content or for style, but often I'll seek feedback for tone. Um, and in some ways, I think, Jelana, it's connected with what you're saying. I want to make sure that um, the feelings I have associated with it are coming across the way I want them to come across, right? Am I, is this coming across as uh, too aggressive, for example, or too assertive? 
is this persuasive enough? So for tone, I really often will, will seek um, advice, ask people to read what I've written, ask multiple people to read what I've written. Yeah, I, I would piggyback on tone. It's good to read what you wrote aloud. You, you hear your tone, you hear clunky words, you, you hear all kinds of things. So everything you, you write should be read. You read it aloud. And, and writing is rewriting. That's, that's the other thing. It's rewriting and editing your own work. And that's the fun part, you know, when you've got it down and then you just go back and you keep cleaning it up and making it shorter and shorter and shorter because we <laughs> use many too many words. Thank you. For sure, for sure. Um, I, I see we're getting a lot in the Q&A on editing, on, on tone, on, um, on, on criticism, but before we turn to that, I'll come back to that in a second, but I just wanted to touch on this question uh, before we go there, and that has to do with um, the events of recent months and weeks and days. Um, and how have those events impacted your writing lives? Of course, I'm referring to the COVID-19 epidemic, the epidemic of anti-Black violence, uh, prolifer proliferation of protests and response. Um, how has that affected how, how often, or for whom you are writing? I, I'll jump in if nobody else wants to. I don't want to immediately Thanks. fill the space. Um, one of the things in one of the things that I've done uh, since in amidst all of this, um, the more recent um, chaos and tragedy that's going on, which is not new, is to actually not write so much and do some editing and invite other people who I think are better able to talk to talk about the issues, to talk about what's going on, to invite them to do the writing. I, 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 right now I'm co-editing a special, uh, a special uh, volume about COVID-19 and the psychosocial, the impact of, on psychosocial services for people with cancer. So it's not, and I'll have to write the editorial, if you will, and I had to write what I thought was important for people to write about, and I'll have to tie their words together, but it's um, different. That's different writing for me. I, I guess what I'm doing is writing letters to the editor, which I've done all my life. Very few are published, but I keep writing them. Um, and as Sue Matterin, uh, one of our alums, uh, is a wonderful uh, letter to the <laughs> editor writer, and she always writes from the point of view of a mental health clinician. Um, and I sent something to the Times, which of course will not be published, but it was in response to something about why people are fleeing New York now that it's no longer a, a wonderful cultural center and so on. And I wrote about having been here since 1958. And um, it's the people and it's in sharing in the lives of people from all over the world and having survived everything from, from what, hurricanes, AIDS, anthrax, um, lockdowns, um, everything. And it's, it's still a city. And of course they didn't publish it, but I think we all have points of view and we should all write all the time. Mm -hmm. And get, then they do publish these letters and that's a wonderful place to have a voice. Um, uh, since COVID-19, uh, I started writing diary. <laughs> I think the last time I wrote a diary, that mm. would be 10 years ago or 12 years ago. I don't remember, so, um, during the period of epidemic, I uh, really used the writing as a therapeutic method to uh, cope with stress, anxiety, and all the mental issues. Uh, I don't have a plan to publish it, but uh, I think for myself, for self-care, I, I, I believe for most practitioners, we need uh, self-care and the writing could be uh, one way to take care of ourselves, especially for mental health. Yeah, I think it's so important for writing to be, you know, about self-care and, and also radical um, 
self-care, right? Like, because writing is so political, especially at a time uh, like like we're experiencing right now. And another thing for me that's shifted with my writing now is it has been very action oriented, right? Like, um, you know, how can I use writing as a political force as a, as a way of um, creating opportunities and space? And uh, recently I worked with some black women on a grant proposal that really is directed around how our communities heal um, and, and how we can sort of uh, cultivate healing, right, in that way, um, particularly um, reaching into, into our past and our history. Um, and I just wanted to attack something I saw someone writing in the chat about, um, about Black women and, and their voices. And I think what's so important, especially connecting with, with this particular question, is that um, a lot of our stories have been told have been voice centered, right? Like it's not necessarily that these are things that have been written down historically, right? And but of course, there's the worship of the written word, and that if it's not written down, then it doesn't exist, or you know, it didn't happen. And so, um, you know, historically for us, that hasn't been the case. And so, I, I think um, I don't think that we need to sort of submit to that um, that that cultural belief in worship of the written word. Um, but I also think that it is a space where we can we, we can share with other folks, right? And and but it doesn't have to be in this way that is approved um, by the people in power. And I think that that was something that kept me bound a lot, right? Like feeling like that my work had to be approved um, rather than really focusing my work on who it's for, right? So if it means writing in blogs, if it means writing a long Facebook post, if it means writing 47 tweets, right? <laughs> like um, the idea is like, who's this for? Um, Patricia Hill Collins talked about this a lot in, in, um, in Black Feminist Thought about, you know, what, is this, what does this mean if the folks that I'm writing for and about can't access this work? Um, and it's just only read by academics who are then going to use it and filter it through a different lens in order to sort of create um, policies and practices for these folks, right? Like, you know, so for me, it's really been about being, taking action um, and, and, and being able to sort of uh, take those, that voice-centered knowledge that we already have um, and being able to share that with a larger audience. Thank you. Um, the the Q&A is really popping, so I'm going to turn attention to that. Uh, for now, and I, I want us to go back to this question of editing. Someone had posed the question, you know, and, and you mentioned it, and you're writing and you're rewriting. How do you know when you're done? When, when do you personally decide, I, I've tweaked you know, enough? I came upon a perfect quote, and I hope I can say it correctly. Isaac Babel said, you know something is done, not when you can't add a sentence, but when you can't take a sentence away. Uh. I fully, agree. <laughs> I fully agree. I fully agree. Other thoughts on that question? That's a great quote. How do I know something is done when I've written? Jelana, I don't know if you want to add some words while I'm trying to think, how is it that I know? <laughs> because things do get finished, but I'm not sure how I know it's done. I guess yeah, for I'm me, it's, oh, go ahead. You're still thinking. Yeah. I, I guess for me, because I'm so, I'm focusing right now on academic writing. Um, I think I know I'm done when I read it through, and I feel, mm. and I feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. I know it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's as as close to that as I can get. Um, so it's just my my sense that I've I've yeah. that I've said what I want to say. I think I'm struggling with this question a little bit because of kind of you know what I mentioned before, um, experiencing writing anxiety. I think also coming from a family and a culture where we feel like you know we have to do twice as good and be twice as good and, and dealing with black respectability politics. For me, this is a struggle, right? It almost feels like my work is. I'm, I'm almost, it's struggle, I struggle with feeling like it's ready to go out. And I think that comes from a bit of perfectionism, right? Like that it has to be perfect, um, that I'm representing all black women, right? So um, that's something I, to be honest, that I agonize over quite a bit. Um, and, it, and it's something that I, I think right now, in all honesty, I'm working to sort of, to, to be able to release, right? Because I think that that is what liberation from a lot of what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, like really looks like. Um, but that, I, you know, I struggled with that question because that is something I'm still dealing with in terms of being able to let the writing be what it is um, and not kind of be bound by, by these, by, by oppression really, right? And, and what that um, 
contributes to the way I understand myself and my work. Mm. Really important aspect. Thank for, you. For clinical writing, the, the way I know that I'm done. So clinical writing in, um, in like a in medical, medical chart, for example, I know when I'm done, when I've reread and I know for sure that there's nothing in what I've written that, um, that's, that no details that are irrelevant to the, to the work that I'm doing okay? and no information that isn't going to be relevant for the other person professionals that will be reading it. So I might have more information because I've spent a lot of time talking with somebody, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to reveal, um, you know, that somebody's going for, um, somebody's going through in vitro mm -hmm. fertilization when it has nothing to do with their child being a cancer patient. It's mm -hmm. Probably not the best example, but mm -hmm. as long as I know I'm not revealing something that I shouldn't be revealing and that it's not my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's my perspective. Along those same lines, there's a related question, I think, uh, and it's about taking criticism well. So it's hard not to take even constructive criticism personally. How do, how do you all deal with that? It's so personal, you're writing, right? And whether it's academic or clinical or, or creative. Um, do you have any strategies around that? Again, uh, I will choose the best time to read the reviewer's comments. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, I'm not uh, stressed out. I'm not mm. bothered by other issues that I feel I'm very ready <laughs> to, uh, to read uh, and to know uh, other people's critics, uh, just to give myself some psychological readiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple hours. Um, I think that will, I think timing is very important. Uh, for me to really, uh, not only for my own kind of mental health, self-esteem, <laughs> all that kind of uh, psychological feeling, but also it also really helped me to understand and take the points from the reviewer's comments because most of the time, honestly speaking, most of the times um, the reviewers, I can, t I can tell the reviewers are, are trying to help me mm -hmm. to improve my writing, mm -hmm. to improve my paper, my proposals. Uh, so find a good time to gather otherwise, I think is important. I, I think they're really good because they make you reflect really on what, what you are about. And some of them are very well taken. And other times you really consider them and you see that the reviewer came from another point of view and they, they have to get that point of view across. You know, they, they were hired to review this book or this article and they've been working on a subject very much like it. And they want to make sure that you give, you know, proper consideration to all the work that they have done. So mm. you have to just kind, kind of weigh it and really respectfully say at some points, no, I don't agree. Right. And let your editor just decide if they're going to let it go. So I've, I've, I've challenged some, I've accepted some, I've done all kinds of things, really. Yeah, I agree with that. Like kind of knowing where to, when to stand your ground um, and when to think about, you know, this, this, this uh, reflection is allowing me to, is opening up space for me to explain this in a different way or um, to, to, to create a way that folks who have different perspectives and different understandings are able to grasp what it is that I'm saying. Um, but also, yeah, there, I think there are times when you do need to, to sort of stand your ground. Um, and I say also, I think sometimes the way that folks are offering critique um, is, is part of that package as well. Like when someone kind of rips through your paper with a red pen on grammar and says nothing about the content, I think that that has a lot of impact on how you receive what's being said. Um, and for me also, it's, it's not always about right or wrong, right? I think, you know, it's, it's really about just um, being able to receive it and, and think about the, the different meanings that it can take on rather than this person is right, this person is correct, this person is better, um, but that this is, this is a different way of understanding what I, what I wrote and how it's being experienced by other people. I have a humorous sidebar here. I had titled my book, The Lioness in Winter, and there was a feminist crit critique that she didn't like the word lioness. lioness. 
because it was like, you know, uh, a heroine or an actress. But I mean, these are animals, you know, I mean, a lioness. I, I, I was trying, <laughs> I don't know how else one could speak of a female lion who was strong. Anyway, I thought that was rather humorous. And I, I said, no, I'm going to use lioness. Um, so that, that's the kind of criticism that you, you get, you get and you have to stand up for. Yeah, so back to that point of drawing the line. This is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. You might mm -hmm. be trying to say something else, right. <laughs> but this is what I'm trying to say. Um, there's, there's a similar question here about, um, and you've touched on this already, but it's about accounting for, for bias or personal voice in, in narrative writing and, and changing voices. And just wondering how our panel might respond to that sort of question. Is the question about creative writing? I think you're muted, Melissa. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it says, how do you account uh, for bias and personal voice in narrative writing? Uh, how do you switch voices within the writing? I think you could apply it to any kind of writing that you, you regularly do. It has to do with lens, I think, right? Or perspective. I think, yeah, like this question gets a lot at like this uh, reflexivity and um, really like reflecting on your positionality and, and where you're coming from. Um, I think it requires like a lot of like interrogation of yourself and really being able to look at the writing not so much objectively because I'm not sure that that's completely possible. I think it's kind of a lie that we tell ourselves when we can be that we can be completely objective, but actually digging deeper into like what biases we actually are. Like there has to be a willingness to acknowledge that you probably have some, um, and then kind of interrogating yourself in that way and thinking about, um, you know, how what you're saying is still a lot of times being reflected through that lens mm -hmm. um, and, and how and how you can sort of work around that. And I think going back to what we talked about for like a, before, I think a feedback is, is good for that as well, especially if you're working with someone who's going to be really honest with you. Um, I'm not entirely sure that that we can do that alone, actually, um, the more I think about that. I mean, it, it may require someone outside to, to take a look, but I, First and foremost, I think it really requires us being really honest with ourselves and not resisting that the fact that we, um, we we may not be as objective as we think we can. I know the scientific process sort of tells us that that that's what that does, but um, not entirely sure that that's possible. We can also write because writing really is a process of discovery, and I think we can very often in our writing write about our thinking about our writing, sort of a meta thing. You know, I came in here thinking this and this, and as time has gone on, and I've seen this and that, I'm reaching a different place. I mean, we can, we can do some of that, I think, which at least helps me, even if I write it and I take it all out afterwards, it helps me understand how I got to where I, where I ended up. We've had a couple of questions about anxiety in writing, and one person writes, as a person of color, oftentimes I won't write um, because writing makes permanent words that can be used to penalize, traumatize, punish. Um, how does that affect panelists' topic choice, research choices, writing choices? Once it's out there, it's out there, right? And then criticisms, uh, fair and unfair, can roll in. How do you get past that? Or how does that impact, do you think, the things you choose to do? That you choose to do following? No, I, I, I think I think they mean how you choose the topics to begin with. You know, in to general. Get, yeah, I think so. I think that's what's meant. I think, I, I guess, some of that again could be. I think that that's wrapped up in oppression, right? Like the fact that whatever we write now is like being represent it represents our entire group. Like that's such an unfair burden that I think that we carry and I, I can relate to whoever asked that question. Um, so I think there's there's some work that we need to do to kind of liberate ourselves from that responsibility that's kind of been mapped onto us, right? Um, and at the same time, there's, there's a realness to what, what it is that you're saying. And for me, what's been really helpful is that 
you know, folks have done this, right? So like looking back at what other folks have written about um, and seeing the work that's already been done because I think so much of our work is hidden. And so looking back and seeing um, who's already tackled this, right? And, and, and how have they done it and what have the responses to that have been? And also I, I go back to this idea of participatory like work and participatory research, right? Like one of the best ways to know if it, how your writing is going to be received or impact the community is to connect with the community. So while we focus on getting our feedback from folks who we may perceive as being higher up, um, I think it's really important that we, we get feedback from folks who are higher up in, in other ways, right? Like mm -hmm. um, who have more insight into what's happening in the community um, and, and can offer better critique in my opinion. Just adding to that, Jelana, and maybe you've done this yourself, inviting, inviting those people who understand what you're writing about better, inviting them to write with you, literally to co-author pieces. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, may, and you being the last author. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jin Yu, someone is, is referring to your statement about uh, writing in your second language or third language mm -hmm. and somehow feeling like it's not your true voice because of that that translational process and, and how to overcome that and, and or strategies for grappling with that. Mm -hmm. I think first the reading is helpful so <laughs> read the other people's writing uh, in, the in the second or third language helps and also um, Daily communication with native speaker also could help us to learn how to communicate ourselves in, a, in the second or third language. I, I had I had a very interesting experience. Um, I used to live a um, native English speaker. Um, so one day after a whole day work in, in my uh, social work uh, field placement when I was a student, um, I came back to home and, uh, and I told her, oh, uh, her name is Rhonda. Rhonda, I'm so tired. I don't want to think and talk in English anymore today. So please leave me alone. Uh, it is very, honestly, it is a very exhausting process to think and speak in another language. But I think that's the kind of the necessary step that we, as a second language writer, we need to go through. It, it could be a long-term task. And I'm still practicing every day. So hard. Yeah. Exhausting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't believe our hour is almost up. Uh, it is 12.56 by my watch. So I wanted to just go around our, um, our circle again of, of wonderful panelists today. Maybe we'll go in reverse alpha order this time, to be, to be fair. Um, but just any, any final thoughts you had about this discussion about writing uh, or, or tips, advice you want to share? So um, I'm going to start with you, Mary. Okay. Final thoughts that, again, Anne said this earlier, mm -hmm. but I think that reading and writing are, deep, are inextricably interconnected. So the more one reads all kinds of things, even my academic writing is influenced by reading um, novels, Cormac McCarthy, right? Anybody, any writer that I admire. So I would say reading is connected with writing. That's the one piece that I would say is most important to me. Great, thank you. Jin Yu, what's on your mind as we close today? Um, start it, write it, start it. Trust me, uh, always the first paragraph and the first chapter is the hardest one. <laughs> Once you go through the beginning, mm. things will get better. Perfect, thank you. Jelana, what would you like to share? Yeah, I think something I didn't mention before and for someone who kind of sometimes struggles getting it out on paper is that talking it through has been really helpful for me, right? And I've actually even sometimes asked permission to record conversations because sometimes you have this amazing conversation and this magic happens and you explain your idea like in a way that you didn't even know you could and then you walk away like oh my god what did I just what did I say like what happened so like you know I've done this with instructors in the past and just like sometimes conversations with friends can I can I just talk to you about what I'm about to write about and then the questions that they're asking just keep, keep you on your feet and, and sometimes if you struggle with the paper the pen and the paper or the computer but you feel free kind of speaking you know 
I think Anne mentioned this earlier, like you're always writing, right? So like if you can capture that and then even listening to that later on and what was captured in that moment can be really helpful. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anne, closing words. From everybody. I think the whole thing is how you get your ideas. Your ideas find you, you don't find them. A subject just gets a hold of you and it won't let go. And it, it, it just, the more you think about it, the more it turns on itself and it opens up possibilities. And some things will tap you on the shoulder and you'll think about them and they don't develop. Um, but when, when they do and they get a hold on you, you just have to go with it. And you know you're on the right track. Usually that's something you're really passionate about. Exactly. Right? A topic that you're really passionate about. Yeah, yeah. You have something to say about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I know you can't hear the applause, but I'm seeing so many wonderful thank yous and notes coming in on our chat box. Uh, I, so I'm going to applaud for our fantastic panelists. Thank you for sharing authentically from your heart, your, your intellectual, your, your, every, your emotional energy, all of it uh, coming through here today. It's really been uh, wonderful. It's been my pleasure to be with you.